Hey, hey, hey. Time for another Out of This World story from our space. Why must we always be tested? Why must we constantly endure? Today on our space, just when you think you've finally got it all figured out, someone changes the rules and hands you a banana instead of a trophy. It's been four years and I thought I was past it, but after this Memorial Day, I'm not and I need advice. I've been stalking these subreddits for a while and I thought just reading people's stories would help me. Or, if I found someone with a similar situation, and I could see how they did it, but I guess my situation is unique. So here we go. First, let me be clear. I don't care if you think this is fake. I don't care if you want to rip me a new one after I vent. It's already happened. I thought I was okay. I thought I moved on. But after last weekend, it all came back, and that anger I had back then just came in full force, and even though I'm back home with my fiancé, that anger towards my ex just won't go away. I spent years in anger management for what she did and the situation that was created and I thought I was okay. Right now I just turned 39. I was 18 when I met my ex Marisol. During that time, I was a gangbanger with the Latin Kings. I was a member since I was 13 and always in and out of trouble. Marisol was a church girl. My grandmother dragged me to Sunday Mass and when I saw her, to me, it was love at first sight. I asked my cousin, who was a friend of hers, if he could introduce us, but he refused. He didn't want me to mess with her. He didn't want me to ruin her. Have you ever met someone that you wanted to make yourself better to be with? Wanted to be that man who would walk the right path? That was her. When I found out that she was going to church almost every day, I hung out by the steps, talking to her. I always walked her to and from church. She made me feel like I wasn't worthless. One thing led to another, and we were dating, and I felt great. For a year and a half, I pushed myself away from the gang life, got my GED, became a regular churchgoer, and was thinking about the future when I got unintentionally pulled back in. I was at a store and ran into someone that I used to have problems with. They were running their mouths and I tried to ignore it. I swear I did. I just let them talk and I walked away. But then I got stabbed in the shoulder blade and I lost my mind. I beat the crap out of him. I got arrested and suddenly it was like the crap I did to make my life better vanished. Marisol was pissed at me. My grandmother kept bringing up my past mistakes and my cousin was telling me that He knew that I wasn't going to change. My public defender saw me trying to better myself and by the grace of God, got me off after a month in lockup. Despite being angry with me, Marisol did visit me almost daily. A month after I got out, I found out I was going to be a father and I didn't want my kid to have a dad that was dead or in jail. We eloped. I went to a trade school to become a mechanic and I busted my butt for my future family. When Luna was born, it was almost the worst day of my life. Marisol wouldn't stop bleeding She went into shock and they had to give her a double hysterectomy. She was in the hospital for months and Luna became my world. I wanted her life to be the best. I wanted to give her the world. When Marisol was released, I promised her that our daughter will have a life far better than ours and for years, I kept that promise. I saved enough money to move us to the suburbs, became homeowners. I was a Girl Scout leader if you could believe that. I made sure Luna went to private school, made sure she knew how to defend herself and always made sure I was the perfect husband. I didn't know my parents, didn't have a positive male role model in my life, so I didn't know what a healthy relationship looked like. That's a lie. TV dads were my male role models and I mimicked them and the marriage they had on TV. As the years went by, I owned my own garage. My cousin became a pastor. My grandmother was still a pain in my butt. My relationship with my wife was stronger than ever. I made sure I kept my prison body, but Luna? Luna hated me. Since she turned 13, she just started hating me. She didn't want me to hug her rolled her eyes every time I told her I loved her, ignored me when I asked her about her day in school. It hurt me and Marisol saw it. She told me that she's a teenager and that I should just let it ride. She will come back to me. For two years it was like that. So for her quinceanera, I wanted to go all out. Got everything she wanted and she was still disrespectful and briefly the old me almost came out just to put her in her place. But instead, I went to my cousin, vented my frustration and doubts about being a good father and he told me to just let her be and he said a prayer for me. I wanted a slideshow for the father-daughter dance. I got a chunk of the pictures of us together, but I realized I didn't have any recent pictures of us. She didn't want to take any. The last time I had pictures of her and I smiling with me was on her 13th birthday, and those were on my daughter's broken tablet. I took that tablet, went to a repair shop, and I didn't care the cost. I needed that tablet fixed. After a day and $300, the tech fixed it and I was happy. I knew her passcode, but I never bothered invading her privacy. I just wanted those pictures, and when I opened that tablet and looked in the gallery, there they were. 
my little girl smiling and happy to be with me. I felt great. Then the instant messages appeared. It was my daughter talking to my wife. It was a long banter that she didn't want me to dance with her and it didn't hurt. But like my wife said, she's being a teenager. Then she said something that destroyed me. She texted why she had to do the father-daughter dance with me since I'm not her father. I felt my heart stopped. I got dizzy. My mouth dried up and I needed to sit down. My wife responded that I raised her. I loved her. And that makes me her father. But Luna responded by saying that my cousin is her father and she can't wait for her to turn 18 so she could tell me the truth and she could live with her real dad. That she hated me and that she thanked God that I'm not her father. Marisol began cussing her out saying that it was a mistake for my cousin to tell her the truth two years ago, and the more they talked, the angrier I was getting. My wife lied to me for 15 years. My cousin, whom I confide my issues about Luna and my fears about being a bad father, not only effed my wife, but had me raise his child. I wanted to hurt them. I felt a mixture of anger, sorrow, and grief. I wanted to scream, cry, and die at the same time if that makes any sense. I went to a dark place, and so I wouldn't do anything stupid, I told Marisol that I needed to focus on work so I could pay the quince, and instead I drove to Manhattan and saw my old public defender, who wasn't a low-level attorney anymore. He had a nice expensive firm near Midtown, East. I was surprised that he remembered me, but apparently I was his first case as a public defender. We sat down and I told him everything, gave him the tablet, and when he turned it on the messages just kept coming. Only this time, Luna was talking to my cousin, her real father, and he was telling her to give me a chance. How I was always there for her? But Luna told him that so was he, how it makes sense that they have so much in common and even called him Poppy in multiple times in their conversation and he responded and told her that she was his little girl. We went through our options and he asked me what do I want to do and I told him that I wanted to go full scorched earth. I wanted to poison the well and he asked me several times if that is what I wanted and nodded. I also told him that everything had to be filed before the quince in two weeks. So we sat down and spent the next 12 hours on what was needed to be done and I followed his instructions to the letter. I secretly placed my business for sale, called the private school and told them that I will not be paying for next year, closed the college accounts and the savings that I had for Luna and prepared to place my house for sale online. No one was the wiser. I followed his instructions perfectly. There was only one thing I deviated from, the day of the quince. That day went off without a hitch. The whole family was there. Luna was smiling, having fun. Marisol kept asking me if I was okay and I lied to her. It was hard lying to her. From the moment I met her, I never lied to her and during those two weeks, every time I kissed her, held her, made love to her, it was hard not to scream at her. It was hard not to hate her. She knowingly let me raise another man's child. She slept with my cousin, a man who I saw as my brother, the godfather of my child, the best man when I eloped, my confidant. So the rage was hard to suppress to say the least. When it was time for the father-daughter dance, I called her to the center of the stage. She looked annoyed, but walked over. I had the music playing and she smiled and it tore me apart, seeing her smiling at me. For years I wanted to see that smile again and now I didn't want it. As we danced, I had the slideshow playing, pictures of the two of us and towards the end of the song, screenshots of her text messages with her mother and real father. Needless to say, this didn't bode too well. Marisol looked like she saw a ghost. Luna just kept staring at the large screen and my cousin just stared at me with fear. Marisol ran to me and told me that she could explain and I told her that I filed for divorce, that she could explain it in court. She grabbed my arm, begging me and I pulled back. I told Luna that I busted my butt to give her the world and now she doesn't deserve it. I began to walk out, but not before telling my cousin that every time I see him, I'm going to knock him out. Then I knocked him out. The aftermath was harsh. Marisol and Luna were at my grandmother's apartment. Her family was shocked and disgusted with her. They wanted nothing to do with her. Her father actually apologized to me. I don't know why. He never liked me despite turning my life around. That man hated me, but now I was the perfect husband and father. But just a few days prior, I was the former piece of crap. My grandmother had the audacity to tell me about the story of Abraham and how he came back from battle three years later. His wife had a one-year-old child and he raised him as his own and how I should be like Abraham. So I told her to get the F out of my house. Marisol came a few days later crying as soon as she saw me, telling me that it was an accident, that when I was arrested she was so angry at me and my cousin was there to console her and one thing led to another and they had sex. It happened only one time and she was faithful to me ever since. She was willing to take a lie detector test to prove it. So I asked her how long she knew Luna wasn't mine and she started crying more. That look she gave me just told me that she knew from day one and asked her to leave. She wanted to go to counseling, 
tell me that I'm overreacting and we should make it work. It was in the past and I needed to get over it. That I am Luna's father, despite what happened, and I allowed my temper to get the best of me. I must have repeated, get over it, over a dozen times at full volume while grabbing her crap and tossing it out the door. I called her a lying whore. I told her that I didn't want to see her effing face ever again. And I told her that this life that I built no longer belongs to her before shoving her out the door. A couple of weeks went by and she kept blowing up my phone. Not once Luna tried to reach out to me. Marisol was shocked to learn that I sold my business. Even more so, she learned that I had an open house. She came in screaming, telling the viewers to get out of her house and pleading with me to seek help, that I was ruining our marriage, that I had no right to sell our home, the home where we raised our child, and I told her that this house is full of lies. It's a house where I raised another man's child, and when I sell it, I will give her half and order her to get out before I call the cops. It was a bluff. All she had to do was play the victim, and I would have been arrested, but she didn't. She complied. Shortly after this, my cousin came to talk to me and I knocked him out, dragged him outside and closed the door. I refused mediation. Marisol wanted to reconcile, but I didn't. I wanted a divorce and my attorney filed for a fast track divorce and in three months, we were in the Nassau County Courthouse. I barely spoke to anyone during that time. I read horror stories about the court system, especially during divorce proceedings, but I didn't have that. I had a female judge who was very fair. My attorney took care of everything. First, Marisol's lawyer tried to talk about my past when I was in a gang, as if my past barred a reason for me to be a terrible husband and father. But my attorney quickly smacked that down, and the judge reprimanded her attorney for trying to shame someone who turned their life around. My attorney presented all the evidence and offered a lump sum alimony payment with the pending sales of the house and business. At first, Marisol kept asking me to reconsider, but I ignored her, and when she finally realized that I'm not budging, she agreed. Yet the real surprise happened when it came to child support. My attorney presented all of the text messages from Luna's conversation with Marisol, showing that not only Luna knew I am not her father, but she cannot wait to be with her real father, saying that she no longer has to live a lie. Marisol was completely caught by surprise from this. Then my attorney filed a motion to have my name removed from Luna's birth certificate, have my last name removed as well as not being responsible for any child support since all parties agree that my cousin was her father. Marisol was shocked by this. She yelled at me begged me not to do this to Luna, that I am her father because I raised her and as pathetic as I may sound right now, but if Luna didn't act that way towards me, if she didn't say those things, I would have agreed. There were moments that I wanted to reach out and try to make it work, but then I would look at Luna's continuing text messages to her friends, her real father and mother, and I refocus on my resolve. To this day, I didn't know what hurts the most, being lied to by a woman who you thought was the love of your life or having a child who you tried to make their lives better, to give them the world, just toss you aside like trash. The judge was quiet for a long while, reading the page after page after page of the text messages. In the end, she agreed. I was not financially responsible for Luna and my name could be removed. My attorney also filed for a motion for the courts to go after my cousin to pay for child support and a motion to sue my cousin in civil court for all the money I've spent raising Luna. The private schools, dance classes, Girl Scouts, horseback lessons, everything I have ever spent on that child. And after my attorney explained to the judge that my cousin committed fraud for knowingly allowing me to raise his daughter and not offer any financial support or assistance, it was a Hail Mary and the dang judge agreed. I didn't bother looking at Marisol when the judge made her decision. I didn't bother listening to her as I walked out of the courthouse. I didn't care as I heard her cry, her telling me that she only cheated one time and was faithful ever since. I just didn't care anymore. A few weeks later, my ex called me shocked that I stopped payments at Luna's private schools and all of her activities and told her to call her baby daddy before hanging up. Even Luna called me, first time since this entire order and she effing calls me crying that she has to go to public school, that they were moving to the old neighborhood and how scary it was and how she wanted us to be a family again. I told her to go to her real father, the man who she truly wanted, and ask him. I yelled at her, told her that not only she knew for years, but I read all the text messages the back and forth and from her own words, she was thankful that a hoodlum like me wasn't her father, even though I haven't been a hoodlum since the day I found out I was going to be a father. I hung up on her after that. I thought about ending the countless times, thought about ending my cousin, but I made him pay. He had to pay me a half a million dollars, half a million that was all mine and not one cent belonging to my ex because she agreed on the lump sum. I didn't care that the money came from the church. I was hurting. I left New York shortly after, went to Idaho, as far away from New York as possible. I just picked a random state and city and just left. Opened up a new shop, got a house, but for two years I had trust issues. For two years I saw a therapist, anger management, 
I went to rage rooms. It was difficult until I found myself going back to church and ironically, that was where I met my fiance. Jocelyn is wonderful. She just turned 30 at the time and we just hit it off. I told her everything that happened to me. I explained to her that I'm going to have trust issues and she understood. A year later, she told me that I was going to be a dad and insisted that for me to have a DNA test just so I can have peace of mind. I forgot what it felt like to be happy again and when my son was born, I was overjoyed. I called my grandmother for the first time in years. She cried and when I told her about my son, she insisted that I come to New York so she could meet her great grandchild, guilt tripping me by saying that she's 90 and would like to see me one more time and I agreed. We flew to New York, rented a car and drove to Bushwick. The one thing I dislike about the hood, you only need to see one person from your past and the whole effing neighborhood knows that you're back. My grandmother saw my son, met my fiance, made an offshoot comment in Spanish about her being white and I just yesed her to death. I was planning to spend the week, do the tourist thing for once. It was Jocelyn's first time in her life in the Big Apple and I wanted to make it special. Dang it, nothing works out as planned. First my ex shouted my name from downstairs. I looked out the window and was surprised how fat she got. My grandmother told me in Spanish to talk to her and Jocelyn agreed. I went downstairs, was awkwardly silent for a minute and that anger just came back like a flood. Marisol told me that I looked good and she said that she looked like crap. She told me that she missed me, that she'd never been with another man since the divorce and I ignored her. She even had the audacity to tell me that I'm a grandfather and I gave her a look. Apparently Luna got with a decent guy and got knocked up at 18. Her baby daddy joined the Marines to support them and her father wanted nothing to do with her, just pays the child support and refuses to acknowledge her. He's no longer a pastor and is working at the Banco Popular two blocks over. Then told me that Luna named the baby after me and I couldn't stand looking at her. Marisol wanted me to wait because Luna was on her way over and I just walked away. I went to my grandmother's house and I didn't have to tell Jocelyn anything. She just knew and we left. In the elevator I told her what happened and she smiled and told me everything was going to be alright. The look on Marisol's face when we left the building. She was looking at my fiance like she was the other woman and Jocelyn without missing a beat introduced my son to her. Well she said, I would like you to meet his biological child. That was the knife twist, but she knew my pain. Marisol kept trying to stop me from leaving, telling me that Luna felt bad about what she did and Jocelyn wanted me to make amends, but I was so angry. I hopped into the car, ignoring Marisol's pleads and Jocelyn told me to extend an olive branch, so I gave her my number so Luna could call me and left. At the red light, I saw my cousin by the Cuchifrito sand and I don't know what came over me. I got out of the car, ran up to him and beat the crap out of him. Jocelyn was screaming telling me to stop and when we locked eyes, I could see the fear. I spit on him and left. I'm back home, working, being a dad and a good fiance to a beautiful woman, yet since going back, when I'm alone with my thoughts, the anger comes back. Luna did text me with a picture of her smiling with her son and telling me that she was sorry for what she did, yet I don't know if she's sorry that she missed me or if she's sorry because the man she wanted her to be her father wasn't the man she thought he was. I'm so confused and I'm scared to reach out to her. I want to get past this. I want to move on. My family was my everything. My daughter was my world. Even after these years, it still hurts. It still makes me angry, but I know I need to move on, but it's hard. I want to reach out to Luna, but I'm so scared. I have people telling me to let her back in, but all I could think about are those text messages and the lies, the constant lies. I need help and my usual methods are not working. Thank you for reading this. I needed a vent. Like I mentioned, I don't care if you think this is fake. I really don't give a rat's butt, but your help is appreciated. Well, if this is fake, I've got to say you've got one twisted imagination, but hey, who am I to judge? We're all just navigating the dumpster fire of life in our own special way, right? The betrayal you experienced from your ex-wife and cousin, coupled with the revelation about Luna's true parentage, is a lot to process. It's natural to feel a range of emotions including anger, confusion, and hurt. And knocking out your cousin at your daughter's quinceanera? Classic. But hey. At least you found some solace in your new life. Idaho seems like a nice place. Quite a place to start over. Isn't seeing that your ex has gained a bit of weight enough to know that you're living a better life? Yeah, maybe talking to Luna will give you some closure and maybe that will help you finish some unfinished business, but only when you're ready. Update. I'm waiting for the mods to approve this. It's been a while and yesterday was Father's Day. Luna tried calling me several times and I looked at the phone. I wanted to answer, I didn't, but all that kept lingering on my mind were those messages. What she said to her mother, to her real father, her friends, so I ignored it. Eventually I listened to her voice and she sounded so cheerful, 
She briefly apologized for her actions, but to me, it didn't sound sincere, just passive. Maybe I'm overthinking it. She mentioned about her son, her fiance, and asked me to call her. Simple requests and I became infuriated. My grandmother and my fiance are telling me to give her a chance, but when I asked my grandmother if Luna or Marisol ever asked about me in the four years I left, she said Marisol did, constantly, but not Luna. So in my twisted mind, I think Luna wants me in her life to see her child would be taken care of. Or maybe she wants to milk me and that made me so angry. Even Marisol tried calling me constantly and I'm already thinking about changing my number. So I spent the majority of my father's day in the gym, hitting the heavy bag, and I have an appointment with an anger management group. Maybe they can give me an outside opinion. If this ever gets published by the mods, I would like to get your opinion as well. In the meantime, I'm just figuring this out on my own. Update 2 I would like to thank a certain person for his advice on sending an email as a start. I sent a small email to Luna that simply said, what do you want? Didn't expect the multi-paragraph response. She started the email profusely apologizing for how she acted. She said when she found out I wasn't her father, she was angry. She confronted her mother and she cried, making her promise not to tell me. Since she felt lost, she began to talk to my cousin, her real father, more and more. He told her out of my violent past, the things I used to do, things that I kept a secret from her. This made her angry, and the more they spent time together, the more she pulled away from me. She said she felt bad from time to time, but my cousin would reinforce her feelings towards me. The day of the quince, she said while we were dancing, she realized how stupid she was acting. She realized how much I loved her, and then her messages appeared on the screen. In the days that followed, she was told by my wife's side of the family to give me space, to not call me, and she listened. She said she was watching her family fall apart because of her, and she couldn't do anything to fix it. She told me she understood why I did what I did, yet she wanted to reach out. Her grandfather kept telling her that I loved her, that I raised her, and despite what I saw through her messages, I will do the right thing and she believed him. During the divorce, her mother fell in a dark place, not talking to her, barely eating, she was just existing. When she found out that my name was removed from her birth certificate, she said she had a panic attack. Her mother told her that they will have to move back to Brooklyn, and when she asked about her life in school, her mother told her, that was the life your father gave you, and he's not your father anymore. So she called me, begging, and I cursed her out and then hung up. She cried for days. She tried to reach out to my cousin, who pretty much ignored her. She even went to the church, and he told her to leave. Called her a mistake. Her mother refused to talk to her, basically locked herself in a room, only leaving to use the bathroom or take a shower. She begged her grandfather to take her to go see me, and when they came to Long Island, she learned that I moved. Her grandfather told her that he will talk to my grandmother and find out where I went. For the next two years, according to her, it was hell. The entire neighborhood knew what happened to her and her mother. Her father avoided her at all costs and tried not to pay child support. It took her grandfather to threaten him to start paying. In the meantime, her mother didn't talk to her. She was just locked in her room. The few times they did speak, she called her an ungrateful girl, and she was the reason why she lost the love of her life. Her grandfather had to put her mother in her place by telling her that her infidelity was the reason why she lost the love of her life, and she locked herself back in the room. So Luna barely stayed home, and that was how she met the father of her child. He worked in the corner bodega. They were the same age, and if, after a few months of talking, one thing led to another, and she ended up pregnant. Her grandfather was furious, but when her boyfriend insisted that he would marry her, that cooled things down. Luna said her pregnancy was a blessing in disguise. Her mother began talking to her again and even began leaving the room to, to be by her side for every checkup. Being a senior in high school while pregnant was cliche, but she made it work. A month before the baby was born, she graduated and her boyfriend joined the Marines. He wanted to elope before leaving, but she wants a wedding. Her boyfriend had no issues naming his son after me. Apparently his father was absent and the fact that he was a junior was a reminder that he shared the name of a man who didn't want him. When she heard I was in town, she got a speeding ticket trying to get to my grandmother's apartment. She wanted to see me, wanted to apologize, wanted me to see her son. She just wanted to see me. However, she was late and she cried. When her mother gave her my number, she wanted to call immediately, but the entire neighborhood was talking on how I beat her father up, so she waited. Her mother was sad to see that I moved on and have a son. Luna was happy to know she had a little brother, but her mother became a little more depressed. I felt sorry for Marisol. After I read the email, I called Marisol and asked her if this was true that she refused to talk to Luna for years and blaming her for our divorce. She confirmed it, and at first I yelled at her, but I regained my composure when I heard her crying. I told her to move on, find someone else, but she said no. She told me that I was her husband and I will always be her husband. 
it broke my heart a little. I then had my grandmother go see my cousin so I could talk to him. The second he heard my voice, he began to cry and begged me to forgive him. I just asked him why he didn't be a father to Luna, why he poisoned her against me, and he said it was envy. He was in love with Marisol and I took her from him. When I was arrested, he consoled her, manipulated her, and barely last a second with her, and she realized what she was doing and shoved him off of her, but he had already come. When she found out she was pregnant, he knew the baby was his. They both knew. It was supposed to be a secret. Marisol took her double hysterectomy as God's punishment for her infidelity and deceit. When Luna turned 13, he was drunk. Seeing my life and envy was the one sin he couldn't shake, so he wanted to ruin it, and he did. I told him when we see each other again in hell, I will be his eternal torturer and hung up on him. Jocelyn was there for me. She told me that everything will be okay. Luna and I commented through email. I spoke to her on the 4th. She spent over an hour crying while talking to me. I even spoke to her boyfriend who asked me permission to marry her. I thought it was funny, but honorable. My wedding is next month and Jocelyn wants me to invite Luna. At the same time, Luna wants me to give her away for her wedding in November. My future father-in-law sat me down and told me that he couldn't grasp my situation, but respect the road I took. Because the road saved his little girl, gave him a handsome grandson and a future son-in-law that he would kill for. That made me laugh. But he told me that I need to let go of the anger and start forgiving but never forget. He's right. So we gave Luna an invite to my wedding, even offered to pay for the plane ticket. Her boyfriend, or should I say fiance, said that he will work it off at my garage when they arrive. I kind of like him. As for me giving her away, I don't know yet. Let's see how the wedding happens first. Thank you again for the advice and the few DMs. No one was rude or disrespectful. You guys helped me so much. I'll update if something happens, but for now, I have to get things ready for my wedding next month. Just when you think it can't get any crazier, bam! Someone's marrying their cousin's ex, who's actually their sister's uncle's dog walker's nephew twice removed. Not literally, but you know. It's like a family tree turned into a jungle gym. You're handling it like a champ. Turning to an anger management group was a smart move, and it seems like it's helping you gain some perspective on everything. It's clear there's a lot of history and complexity in your relationship with Luna, Marisol, and your cousin. It must have been tough to hear all of Luna's side of the story, but it's also important to consider multiple perspectives, even if they're difficult to hear. And it seems like you're doing just that, which is commendable. As for Luna's upcoming wedding and your own, it sounds like there's a lot to think about. Giving her away is a big decision, but it's great that you're keeping an open mind about it. And hey, if her fiance is willing to work off the plane ticket at your garage, that's a win-win, right? Keep taking things one step at a time and remember to take care of yourself amidst all the chaos. Might be my final update. A lot has happened in such a short window. Again, I would like to thank the large number of support within the DMs. Of course, there were hate messages, but all I could say to those people, what you would have done and what I did are two different mindsets. And until you go through the same situation or something similar, don't tell me how I should have felt. Leading up to the wedding, I was already on eggshells. Jocelyn was the happiest I've ever seen. My in-laws were freaking due to the number of people that were coming. I swear, I think the whole town came. While all of this was happening, I was an hour and a half away in Boise waiting for Luna and her family at the airport. In the days leading up to her visit, we spoke a lot, her mostly crying, apologizing and me just listening. When she couldn't speak anymore, I was talking to her fiance who was more down to earth. When their plane landed, I was so scared, not for seeing her again, but I was afraid due to my anger. I was afraid that I would lose my temper. The second she saw me at the terminal, she ran to me, crying and for a split second, I saw my daughter when she was seven. It was weird picturing a child in my mind. She ran screaming, Daddy, and the second she hugged me, she began to cry loudly. It was like a wail that caused so many people to look at us. She just kept saying sorry over and over, asking me to forgive her to do so. It was as if she felt the second she let go, I was going to vanish. After she composed herself, her fiance properly introduced himself, and then they introduced me to their child. I won't lie, I cried. I wasn't angry, but I cried holding this infant. Luna was also the spitting image of her mother when she was 19, which made me wonder about Marisol. During the drive home, we talked about her fiance's boot camp, how he's going to be a career man, how Luna was going to college online to learn accounting, mostly catching up conversation. When we arrived at my house, Jocelyn and her family had a spread ready for them. Since we've been together, Jocelyn learned how to cook Spanish foods, but the week leading up to Luna's visit, she went a little overboard. Yet I get it, she wanted to make an impression. Her and Luna just hit it off. 
Every few minutes, Luna would walk towards me just to give me a quick hug and go back to Jocelyn. I was just holding my son and my grandson. While Jocelyn was introducing Luna to her family, I put the babies to bed and I went to the porch for some fresh air. Luna's fiance was standing by the foot of the yard, staring at all the bison roaming around. For a moment, I wanted to give him the dad talk, but I felt it, that it wasn't my place. Instead, I asked him how he liked the view and he was awestruck. I knew the feeling. Living in the city the majority of your life, wide open spaces is a marvel to take in. After a minute or two, he looked at me and told me how regretful Luna was. I've been with your daughter for three years and not a day goes by when she mentioned how much she misses you and regret what she did. Out of everything you told me, that single sentence constantly replays in my mind. Her fiance's name is Roberto. For a man who's only 19 years old, he acts and talks like a man in his 30s. That tells me he had a rough life to mature so quickly. I know the feeling. The following day, I had to go to the shop and Luna practically jumped in the car with the baby. Even Roberto told her it was okay and to enjoy herself. Luna looked like she was going to hyperventilate and I told her that we'll work a half a day and I'll spend the rest of the day with her. That seemed to do it and I slowly began to realize how traumatized Luna was. During the drive, I asked Roberto how bad she was. She has severe abandonment issues, constantly afraid that he's going to leave her, despite him telling her that he will never. She calls him a lot, a bit clingy at times, and in the beginning, afraid to be herself in fear that they will break up. He had to reaffirm his love for her just so she could let her guard down a little. That was my doing, I know that, but he doesn't blame me. He told me he completely understood why I did what I did. Allow me to say that Roberto is a terrible mechanic. He knows nothing about cars. So I had him clean up the shop so he could work off the plane tickets. We closed early and when we arrived, Luna practically ran towards me. She looked unhinged. I told her that I will be back and she went to her fiance. When I walked into my house, Jocelyn told me that Luna needs to be reminded that everything is going to be fine, that I won't leave her again. I didn't know what to say, but Jocelyn grabbed my hands and told me that Luna is hurting and she needs her father. For the next couple of days, I spent all of my time with Luna, getting reacquainted with her. I took her to my in-law's ranch and showed her the bison, the elks, and took her on a hike. Two days before the wedding, I apologized to her for leaving. I apologized for the way I acted. I apologized for the actions I took. She didn't want to hear any of it. She told me that there's nothing that I should apologize for. She said she knows the, she was the reason why it all fell apart, that she knows it was her fault and I had to stop her. I began to cry. I told her that it wasn't her fault. I was angry, I was hurting, and despite what happened, I should be the one who should apologize. We both cried and just held each other. Luna appeared to be slightly better. On the day of my wedding, she was happy. In the last minute, Jocelyn made her into a bridesmaid and Roberto a groomsman. The wedding was beautiful. During the reception, I asked the DJ to play the song from Luna's Quince, and I asked her to dance with me. She was crying the entire time, holding on to me for dear life as we danced. I haven't felt this happy in a long time. I let Luna and her fiance stay in my house, taking care of her little brother while I went to Hawaii for my honeymoon. When we got home, she was happy. She hugged us and it felt great. Roberto told me that he's going to Camp Dwyer in Afghanistan and would like to know if Luna could stay near us. He would pay for an apartment near us until he could buy a house. Of course I said yes. They went back to the city the day before yesterday. Like I said, it's been eventful. Luna's wedding is in November and Roberto is leaving in December. Roberto sent me what constitutes as a year's rent for a townhouse community three miles away from my house. However, Jocelyn suggested we put a double wide on our property for Luna and let her save her money to buy a house when Roberto comes back. Marisol has been blowing up my phone and based on the messages she left, she's not happy that Luna is moving. Right now, my focus is on my family and to mend my relationship with my daughter. The OP updates in the comments section. Update. First, I would like to thank everyone for the positive feedback and support in the comments and DMs. Also, apologies for the delay in the update. I waited for Luna to come back from her honeymoon so I can show her this post. Our therapist wanted us to have full transparency when it comes to this situation. I wanted to make sure for me to share any more information since this is also about her. She read the post, but I refused to let her see any of the hateful comments considering how much she was crying from the post. Yet, she had no issues with me posting an update. Then a tragedy happened and the passing of my grandmother and I had to place it on hold. So let's begin where I left off. Jocelyn and I managed to get a double wide on our property and had everything ready for Luna and Roberto. Many people wondered why Jocelyn kept pushing to make peace in the beginning. Jocelyn didn't want my lingering anger to affect our family and wanted me to make peace with myself for our family's sake. I am grateful for that. 
As I mentioned before, Marisol was constantly calling me, and the day the Luna left New York, I spoke to her. She was crying and angry with me, telling me that I took her child and grandchild from her. I tried to explain to her that I want to rebuild my relationship with Luna, and almost immediately she began asking me about rebuilding my relationship with her. I had to tell her that I couldn't, which caused her to cry and she hung up on me. Luna and Roberto loved the trailer, and the first thing Roberto did was starting the process to repay me. I told him that it wasn't needed, but he insisted and I appreciated it. A few days later, Luna and I had our first therapy session, and I learned of all the anxiety medication she was taking, and I learned that she suffered from chronic panic attacks. One thing I can share about our sessions is that Luna is very remorseful, and she suffered from years of verbal abuse from Marisol. There was things that shocked me, some things that I found to be unbelievable, but was confirmed when I spoke to my former father-in-law. Marisol verbally and emotionally abused her. My cousin mentally destroyed her, and despite what my feelings were and the actions I took, I know I hurt her too. Two weeks after they arrived, Roberto received news that he was being deployed sooner, so they had to move their wedding up. At first, Luna wanted to wait for him to come home, but Roberto insisted. He wanted them to be married before he left. Jocelyn and I offered to help pay for the wedding, but Luna told me she only wanted me to walk her down the aisle and give her away. I know people kept telling me to get a DNA test because there wasn't one from the court due to the circumstantial evidence that was provided. Allow me to tell you there's no need for that. Luna is O positive, I'm AB negative, Marisol is B positive, and my cousin is O positive. However, despite what happened, Luna is my daughter. I only wished I wasn't blinded with rage. Anyway, the wedding had to be small since it was being done on my in-law's ranch. My former father-in-law, Roberto's mother, Marisol, and my grandmother were invited. Only two RSVPs. My grandmother couldn't come because she wasn't feeling well and Marisol was admitted into a hospital for trying to hurt herself. Luna didn't take the news well and I was angry at Marisol because she expected Luna to come back to New York to help take care of her. On the weeks leading to the wedding, I learned I was going to be a father again and I was ecstatic. Roberto learned the hard way about breaking a horse and I began teaching him how to fix cars. Again, I like this kid. The day before the wedding, my former father-in-law arrived with Roberto's mother. His mother is a very kind person and I commended her for raising a fine young man. My former father-in-law was stoic as always, but we spoke. He told me that he was disappointed that I left, but given the circumstances, he understood. He only wished that his daughter would move on as well. On the day of the wedding, Jocelyn was Luna's maid of honor and I tried my best not to cry as I walked her down, but it was difficult. It was even more difficult for her. During the reception, we played the Quince song again for our father-daughter dance and again she just held on to me. For those who wanted to know the song, it's Cinderella by Stephen Curtis Chapman. During their honeymoon, things were getting back to normal and I was planning to write an update. But a few days before they came home, my grandmother passed. This hurt me because she wasn't just my grandmother, but my mother. As I mentioned, I never knew my parents. Both my mother and father passed away alongside my cousin's parents when I was a few months old from a car accident and she raised us together. So while preparing to go to New York for the funeral, I was trying to control myself and prepare to see my cousin. We went as a family to New York. My grandmother was laid to rest in Cypress Hill Cemetery. Yet during the funeral, with my wife, daughter, and son-in-law by my side, I wasn't angry. I didn't bother acknowledging my cousin during the funeral, and as we left, my cousin kept trying to talk to me, practically begging for me to yell at him, to hit him, and for some reason, me ignoring him just hurt him even more. A few days before we went back to Idaho, Luna and I visited Marisol at Bellevue. She was excited to see us, sad that she missed the wedding, and we thought everything was fine until we had to leave. She began to cry, telling the orderly that she wanted to go home with her husband, begging me to take her home, that I was the love of her life and to please just take her home, and I just cried as they took her away. Luna broke down as well, and it took a while before either of us had the strength to leave the visitor's lounge. My former father-in-law told us that Marisol was never the same after the divorce. She still celebrated my birthday and her anniversary, and he would argue with her to move forward, but she never did. He said she isolated herself and was verbally abusive towards Luna for a long time. Luna's pregnancy just took her out of the trance. He said that the 13 months of being nice to our daughter doesn't take away from the four years of negligence and abuse she has done to her. He hopes the hospital will help her. Jocelyn told me that I will have to forgive her so she could forgive herself. Right now as I'm typing, things are okay. Jocelyn and I are as thick as thieves. Roberto left to Saudi Arabia last week and Luna is trying to appear strong with him gone, but she's doing it poorly. She's been clinging on to me and Jocelyn. I thought Jocelyn might be bothered, but she has been loving spending time with her. She's indeed a wonderful woman. She's been taking Luna all across town, introducing her as her daughter. 
I thought it might bother Luna, but she was very happy about it. I forgave Marisol, and I hoped she could find the strength to move on. It's understandable that you're still processing everything that happened, especially with the passing of her grandmother on top of everything else. Your dedication to repairing your relationship with Luna is truly admirable. It's heartwarming to see how much effort you're putting into rebuilding that bond and supporting her through her struggles. And it seems like Luna's fiancé, Roberto, is a great support for her as well. It's also touching to hear about the growing bond between Luna and Jocelyn. Having a supportive family around can make all the difference, especially during challenging times. As for Marisol, it's a complex situation, but it's clear that you're approaching it with empathy and forgiveness. It's not easy to let go of past for grievances, but it seems like you're on the right path towards healing. One Year Update Before I begin, I would like to thank all of you, even the haters and the doubters. When I posted a year ago, I was in a dark place. I was always angry, lost, depressed. The people here really helped me, and the gratitude that I have for all of you will be with me until the day I die. This community helped me get my daughter back. All of you helped me get my life back. The past year has been great, but not without its ups and downs. I have another son and Jocelyn wants to try for another one. I'm going to have another grandchild. Luna is two months pregnant and my son-in-law has applied for office training school. I'm hoping it gets in. My daughter has been getting a little better since the therapist started her in prolonged exposure. For a while her panic attacks went from mild to severe. And thanks to a certain someone for suggesting exposure therapy because it has been a blessing. Our therapy sessions together were hard in the beginning. Listening to everything she went through, she owned up to her mistakes and I owned up to mine. My in-laws have her working on the ranch, nothing fancy, feeding horses, putting out hay, and my mother-in-law has been teaching her on herding bison. It makes me smile when I see her on a horse. Her face lights up. She and Jocelyn act like mother and daughter and seeing how Jocelyn is overprotective of her is adorable. I am blessed to marry such a wonderful woman. When I met her, she had just come out of a very abusive relationship. She had a swollen eye and bruises around her throat, and I volunteered to fix her father's three tractors for free since they were damaged due to her ex pouring salt and sugar in the tanks. At first, I mind my business, but as she brought me food, we talked and got to know one another, and a month later, we had our first kiss. It was great. I took her out to dinner, and a few days later, her ex came to see me and tried to scare me off. I put the fear of God into him. Sorry, went off on topic there. In the first week of May, my ex father in law passed away, and I was afraid that Luna would relapse but she was strong thanks to Roberto being there with her. That man had a strong impact on her life, and the level of gratitude that I owe him will never be repaid. We all flew to New York, and he had his viewing like a true Boricua. He had a live salsa band, an open bar, and a buffet with pateles, pernil, sancocho. All of his favorite foods were there for all to chow down. Do not mourn me, celebrate me. That was the banner over his casket that was draped with the Puerto Rican flag and he was wearing his vanilla ice cream suit. I couldn't help but smile the entire time. Marisol was there, but she was just staring into nothing. It was like her brain shut off only to turn back on when Luna or I sat next to her, and she began talking about preparing for the quince. After a while, she realized where she is, and her brain shuts off again. Her therapist told us during the second day of the viewing that her mind is stuck in a moment she was at her happiest. When Luna walked away, the therapist told her that, in her professional opinion, she believed my cousin may have raped Marisol and her mind protected her from that trauma, rationalized it, and made her believe it was a moment of weakness. That messed me up, and I told Jocelyn what the therapist said, and she was shocked. She insisted that I should tell Luna, but I was afraid to. She made so many steps to get better, I didn't want her to revert back. Instead, we told Roberto first, who wanted to go and find my cousin, but I talked him down, and then we sat as a family and spoke to Luna. It was a bad night, a really bad night, we had an incident at the burial two days later. My cousin showed up uninvited and caused a scene. He was drunk, and I wanted to end him, I believe is the proper term. Instead, I told him to leave. Roberto was holding me back, and my cousin began shouting that he was always better than me, and always will be, and it was because of him and his daughter that I made my life better, so in a way he's responsible for bettering myself. I got angry, and I practically lifted Roberto off the ground to get him, but Luna punched him in the mouth and began pummeling him. She was screaming and crying. She was so angry while attacking him. I briefly hesitated, and Roberto pulled her off of him. As he was getting up, Jocelyn punched him and knocked him out, breaking her index finger in the process. Before we went back home, we had a family meeting and we all agreed that we will transfer Marisol into a mental facility near us, since she has no one else. We are still going to therapy, and with this new realization, my daughter is trying to cope with the fact that she might be a product of rape. Before this happened, I was planning to adopt her since legally she's no longer my daughter. I want to make it official again. 
but I feel like the timing might not be right. I will answer any questions. I owe this community a lot, and God bless you all. This is heavy information, OP. I'm sorry. It's heartening to hear about the progress Luna has made with exposure therapy and the positive impact Roberto has had on her life. Family support and love can be incredibly healing, and it's evident that Luna is surrounded by a strong support system. The revelation about Marisol's trauma is undoubtedly difficult to process, and I commend you for handling it with care and compassion. It's understandable that you're hesitant to share this information with Luna, but ultimately transparency and honesty may help her navigate through this challenging time. Update, one year later. How things are going? Hello everyone. It's been a while and I would like to express my gratitude to all of you. My family continues to grow. I have two grandchildren, a boy and a girl, two sons and another daughter on the way. For a while I was guilt stricken, being a bit depressed after being told what happened in Marisol's hypnotherapy session. From the explanation, she said no twice before freezing up for over a minute and she begged him to stop, which was when my cousin finished and got off of her. The therapist said she'd rolled to her side and kept repeating over and over, it was a mistake, and she convinced herself that it was a mistake that truly impacted me. It caused this cloud of depression to hover over me. I blamed myself. I blamed my cousin. I began playing scenarios in my head, focusing on the could've, would've, should'ves, and it hit so hard. I told myself that my cousin was right. I did ruin her. I struggled to remember every family interaction to see if there were any signs, anything that would have indicated that he did something to her, and there was. Whenever he was in the house, she was never in the same room with him or alone with him. I never noticed it, but now, everything is so vivid. Hindsight is a real witch. Over the next few months, Luna and I sat in a family therapy session with Marisol. Like many of you, therapists also asked me what I would have done if Marisol told me the truth when I got out. Honestly, I would have taken him out. If she would have told me years later, I would have beaten him by an inch of his life. Finally, I was asked if she would have told me during the quince. I said I would have believed her at first. However, I would have asked, poked, prodded, and eventually found out the truth. The way I was feeling back then, I would have sent my cousin to the hospital, but I wouldn't have skipped town. I believe that things would have been dramatically different. Eventually, Marisol became consolable. She cried and apologized to both of us. As time went on, Marisol confessed that since she couldn't give me another child, she focused on being the best wife and partner she could be, and when I left, she admitted that when she looked at our daughter, all she saw was my cousin. I asked her why she allowed my cousin to still come to our home. She said that in a way he was my brother. I was always so proud of him, especially when he became a pastor. I spoke very highly of him. I always went to him for advice, and in her mind, she saw him as a mistake, a brief moment of mistake that wouldn't go away. So she avoided him at every turn. Luna's panic attacks came back, a bit more aggressive, but now she's doing well. I officially adopted her last month. It was my birthday gift to her. She couldn't stop crying. She looked so happy. From what I heard, my cousin moved to Puerto Rico after getting fired. The bank had to let him go due to the vast number of people walking into the bank and making a scene. We placed a new trailer next to Luna for Marisol. She was released in mid-March and at first, it was awkward, extremely awkward. I used to watch TV shows with scenarios like this, having your ex-wife and current wife near one another. On TV, they're friendly. That's TV. Jocelyn was very civil, but made a clear boundary for Marisol to follow. However, Marisol told us that she doesn't want to stay on our property. She wants to stay near us, but all she wants is to be a mother and a grandmother. She wants her and me to be friends, but distant friends. And I can respect that. A few times, Jocelyn and Marisol butted heads, mostly on child rearing and cooking habits. My in-laws, like me, felt awkward about the entire situation, and it's not helping that my brother-in-law is a bit smitten with Marisol to the point that Jocelyn smacked him in the back of his head so she could knock some sense into him. It didn't work. The man is two years older than me, a widower of two years with three little girls. He's a really nice guy, a great wrangler, and he's been around my property more than I could care for just so he could try to talk to Marisol. I don't mind, but Jocelyn does. She's very overprotective of her big brother, and she feels that if the two of them do get together, she would not know if it was genuine. I could respect that. There was an accident on Luna's birthday. Shortly after giving her the adoption papers, I danced with Luna, and then with Jocelyn and, and when Marisol tried to dance with me after dancing with Roberto and Jocelyn's brother, I respectfully declined, but enacted Jocelyn's green-eyed monster and she became a bit territorial. On Easter, we were watching the kids hunting eggs and I overheard Marisol tell Jocelyn that she envied her. She was able to give me children. Jocelyn told her that 
Luna is my daughter, despite the circumstances. Luna was mine, and she should always remember that. Marisol cried, and it was the first time I saw them getting along. This is where I'm at right now. Hopefully, everything balances out. Let's get one quick comment from the community. Thank you for the update, OP. I'm glad to hear that Marisol has recovered and been released. I'm very proud of you for stepping up and adopting Luna. Your relationship with Luna is heartfelt and genuine. I'm sure it's been awkward with having Marisol on the property. I'm very impressed by Jocelyn's caring nature and open heart. The way she helps you heal after you're relocated, the way she opened her heart and home to Luna and allowed Marisol to stay on the property was amazing. Jocelyn was a godsend to you. I can understand Jocelyn wanted to keep clear boundaries with Marisol and you. I'm sure she has insecurities that an old flame could rekindle. It is best to keep no physical contact between you two. Congratulations on your expanding family. I wish nothing but the best for all of you. I'm sorry for all the trauma and pain everyone has suffered, but I believe everything happens for a reason. Just be thankful for the blessings that this life has offered you. Godspeed. It's heartening to hear about your progress Marisol has made and the newfound understanding and connection between her and Luna. Luna's adoption is a beautiful testament to the unwavering love and bond you share with her, regardless of the circumstances. Your commitment to providing a stable and loving family environment for her speaks volumes about the depth of your love and compassion. Congratulations on your expanding family, and may the blessings of love and healing continue to guide you on all your journey forward. Update. Why must we always be tested? Healing takes time and patience. Healing takes understanding. It also helps when there's a support system. My wife is my support system. Watching her with my daughter, the way she's there for her, and lately the way she's there for my ex-wife. Taking her to the survivor group meeting every week amazes me with how blessed I am. I sat her down and thanked her for everything she has done. I told her how lucky I am to be with her, and she gave me a wide smile before kissing me. She tells me that I saved her as well, reminding me about her very abusive ex and how trapped she was, then telling me her being there for me and my family was the least she could do. We sat watching TV while holding each other, and that was when I got an I am from my cousin. I quickly blocked him. A week later, I get a letter from him, and I burned it. Another week went by and my wife tells me that her brother is heavily interested in asking her out. I personally do not care, but I told her that Marisol is a grown adult who is healing from a lot of trauma and if he understands that and is willing to be patient, then I have no issues. A day later I get another letter from my cousin and once again I burned it. Normally I would complain about how he found me, but I am named after my great grandfather whose name is extremely unique and my last name is not that common, so finding me with a simple google search wasn't that difficult. In mid-June we were enjoying a bonfire. I smiled at my daughter and son-in-law slow dancing with no music. My wife had her head resting on my chest and I noticed my brother-in-law and Marisol kissing and I smiled. A few days later my cousin tried to reach out to Luna on Facebook and she had a panic attack. Roberto blocked him and later on that day while we were at the supermarket my wife's ex came back to town and had the nerve to try to talk to her. I could see the fear in her eyes and I just reacted. It was a single punch but I made sure it spoke volumes. My wife, my rock, my support was a quaking mess. The way she was shaking and terrified made me want to pounce on him, but the sheriff intervened and told him to leave before checking on Jocelyn. In the years we've been together, I've never seen her so terrified. While the sheriff was talking to us, I watched her ex walking past the window and the bastard was smiling at me. The sheriff noticed and grabbed my arm, telling me to take Jocelyn home. During that drive, she was quiet and when we got home, all she wanted was for me to hold her and don't let go. Luna was extremely concerned and Jocelyn grabbed her as well and pulled her into the hug. None of us had ever seen her like this, and all I wanted to do was protect her. Later that day, her brother showed up and told us that he and the sheriff passed her ex a visit and told him to leave. That didn't work. The man showed up at my shop the next day, threatening to sue me for assault. I just smiled at him. I told him in the 10 minutes he was running his mouth, I came up with half a dozen ways to make him disappear. That shut him up, but for the next week and a half, he kept testing me, testing us. That entire time, Jocelyn was constantly afraid, thinking he might do something to her. To me, her brother was a game warden and warned him to stay away, and the SOB reported him to a supervisor. Every time I wanted to approach him, Jocelyn begged me not to. However, she's my wife and I needed to protect her, but I told her that I will not approach him. Her father soon told me everything about that man, everything he did to her. I told him that I was surprised that he never got rid of him, and he said around the time he was seriously contemplating it, his kneecaps got broken and he left town. He was smiling wide at me, and I couldn't help but smile back. On the 29th, we were preparing for the upcoming Western Idaho Fair, 
when I got another letter from my cousin. This time I left it on my desk. Marisol approached me, asking me if it was okay for her to pursue a relationship with Jocelyn's brother, and I told her it was, but only if she feels that she was ready. She shrugged, telling me that she doesn't know what she wanted, but she does like him and thought about him and his kids a lot. I told her I wanted her to find happiness, and she began to cry, but they were happy tears and I was happy for her. My phone rang. It was the sheriff. Jocelyn's ex and another man is in the hospital. His face is practically smashed in, and the other man had two broken eye sockets. I was preparing for him to accuse me, but then he told me that he had my son-in-law in holding. The sheriff said there was a lot of witnesses that came in my son-in-law's defense. I didn't want to hear it over the phone, and I raced to his office. When I got there, I saw Luna sitting by the front desk with a nasty bruise on her left cheek. The sheriff came to me and told me that according to all the witnesses, Jocelyn's ex purposely bumped into Roberto as he and Luna left the coffee shop. An argument started and Roberto tried to de-escalate the situation. Another man appeared and shoved Roberto and Luna shoved the man and Jocelyn's ex back, prompting Jocelyn's ex to smack Luna and Roberto placing the two men in the hospital. The sheriff is not pressing charges, but he had to inform Roberto's commander. After being released, Roberto had to leave for his 13 hour drive to Yuma immediately. Luna was blaming herself for pushing Jocelyn's ex. Jocelyn is trying to be there for her, but is blaming herself for this entire situation. Marisol is surprisingly there for both of them, and the topping of this crap sandwich came in the other day. A woman who was six months pregnant came to my shop. She asked for my name, and when I saw her, she told me that she was my cousin's fiance, which took me by complete surprise. My cousin has leukemia and has been trying to reach out to me, Luna, and Marisol to make penance. I told her to leave, but she refused. She wanted me and Luna to get tested to see if we were a match to donate bone marrow. She burst into tears, telling me that she doesn't want to have a child grow up without a father. I told her that she will be doing her child a favor. She slapped me. She said that my cousin was completely honest with her. She knows everything that he has done, but she wants him to be in their child's life and again begged me to get tested. I could pretty much guarantee I'll be an effing match because that's my effing luck. When I get back to my office, I opened up my cousin's letter. I was expecting to read a plea for mercy for me to save his life. Instead, it was a letter confessing everything he has done, how while growing up, he looked up to me, loved me, but when I began rebelling and joining the Latin Kings, he hated me for the pain I placed our grandmother in. I took everything for granted, even though I always had his back and scolded him to make sure he stayed in school, he saw me as a hypocrite because I never took my own advice. Me taking Marisol away was the straw that broke the camel's back. He didn't expect me to actually try to make my life better. When I got stabbed and arrested, he saw that as divine intervention and admitted despite her telling him no, he had to have her. He placed in the letter that because of him, the woman he loved was broken. He ruined his daughter and destroyed the only man who loved him unconditionally. He also placed in the letter that if his fiance ever comes to see me, telling me that he was sick, it's true. He is sick, but he doesn't want me or Luna to get tested. That is the path he chose and the outcome will be his. He ended the letter profusely apologizing to all of us. I saw my pastor soon after, venting everything and he compared me to Job. This is ironic because out of all the biblical tales, I hated the book of Job. My pastor told me that everyone struggles like Job, some more than others, but it teaches us to comfort those who suffer and how we become better people through adversity. This morning I went to the hospital. The benefit of a small town is that everyone knows everyone's business. Without asking, the nurse escorted me to Jocelyn's ex's room where I sat there waiting for him to wake up. He was shocked to see me. I had a conversation with him and even though his jaw was wired shut, he completely understood the man I would become if he ever crossed my family again. I forgot how easily it was to become someone so dark. And as of this moment, I am sitting in the cancer ward, just typing this long tirade on my phone, thinking about getting myself tested to see if I am a match. Wonder why must we always be tested? Why must we constantly endure? Why must there be people who want to ruin everything? Last update. Hello everyone, I would like to thank you, even some of the haters and naysayers, especially the ones I met at the Idaho State Fair who were shocked we were real people. Right now I'm sitting on the balcony by my hotel room, spoke to my wife and kids a few hours ago, I missed them. Two hours ago I buried my cousin and I was the only person at his funeral and I was the only person who attended his wake. I tried to donate my marrow to him. When I told everyone what I was going to do, Luna was shocked. Jocelyn was proud of me for taking the high road and Marisol understood. She told me despite all the cruel things I have done in my youth, I was never a killer. I went through a series of blood work to make sure I could do it and even flew to Puerto Rico back in November to personally tell him and he looked so frail in that bed. He struggled to smile when he saw me. 
thought I was there to forgive him, and I told him I wasn't there for that, but I was there to help him. I told him I was a match and was there to donate. He laughed at me and shook his head. He refused. I told him that he needed to stop being a coward and be a father to that child and his fiance was having, and he told me that he was too far gone and that donation would not work. He's going to die and he was okay with it. I spoke to his doctors and they confirmed. My cousin then told me that his fiance emptied his savings, cleaned out his house and disappeared. He said that it was what he deserved and I didn't disagree with him. We soon sat there awkwardly for a few hours in silence, watching TV. I didn't know why I went back the following day just to do the same and repeated it for the rest of the week. No words, just the two of us watching TV. When I got back, I told Luna what happened and she hugged me tightly, asking me if I was alright and I nodded. Thanksgiving came and went. I went back in December for a week doing the same thing, sitting in silence while watching TV. On Christmas, Roberto paid me what he owed me on the trailer. I was shocked. He and Luna then told me that they were going to move to Yuma. I knew I was supposed to be happy for them, but I cried. I didn't want her to move away. I just got her back, and I know it was selfish on my behalf, but I wanted her just a little bit longer and she cried as well, promising me that she would visit as much as she could and I didn't want to let her go, but I understood in the end. On New Year's Eve, my brother-in-law proposed to Marisol and she said yes. I thought they were moving too fast, but Marisol said she put her life on hold long enough and needed to be happy. And then she asked me if I could give her away. I agreed, and we all got crap-faced. A week and a half ago, I went back to Puerto Rico, visited my cousin, and sat down to watch TV. He looked at me and apologized for being a crap person. I looked at him and told him that he was lucky he was dying, otherwise I would pop him in the mouth. That made him laugh, and he said he wouldn't do it, and that comment made me laugh. He died the following day. We were watching TV, and he told me that he was going to take a nap and never woke up. No one else showed up at his wake, and as he was buried, I was the only one there, and as angry as I was at that little effort, I couldn't stop crying as they lowered his casket into the ground. All I could think about was all the times I protected him, the time I taught him how to tie his shoes, helping him with his cursive, teaching him how to play handball, teaching him how to drive, taking him to his first R-rated movie. Every moment of happiness I had with this man flooded, and none of the effed crap he did to me. Just all these good memories came in and I couldn't understand why. I just stood there, silently crying as they poured dirt over him. I'm in this hotel and the burden I had in my chest for so long feels like it's gone and I'm so confused. Therapy didn't help. Anger management, meeting Jocelyn, getting my daughter back. Every positive aspect that happened didn't remove that burden in my chest. But spending time with that man in his final moments took away that burden. Took away that anger and I do not know why or how. All right, one comment from the community before we wrap this puppy up. I won't lie. I cannot say that I'm not happy he is dead because I am. He might be family, you made your peace with yourself and him in the end, but people like him deserve to only have one person attend their funeral and karma truly hit him where he deserved. Good riddance. He was the last piece of the puzzle that you needed to solve to move on and be finally at peace. Your daughter is yours, no matter what, and her family is yours. And your ex-wife, who I feel bad for, but also had reservations on despite knowing she was a victim in the end, found her happiness and the two of you made your peace. I'm truly happy that your life blossomed the way it did, and I'm glad you can finally live without that burden. I cannot say it won't come back to you later on, where you sit for a while and think about it, but that's life, right? I'm only 27 and have a lot of life to live. Today, ironically, is the birthday of my grandmother who took her own life last summer. Two weeks ago, I had to make the choice to put my dog down. Her name was Luna. I have a lot of anger and sorrow in my heart, and your story gives me hope that perhaps, with time, that can be healed. I'm not sure. I send you so many blessings and I hope all your babies, including Luna's kiddos, are healthy and loved. The journey you've been on, from grappling with the darkness of your past to finding moments of peace and closure, is truly inspiring. Your willingness to confront your own demons and extend compassion even to those who have wronged you speaks volumes about the depth of your character. The passing of your cousin may have brought a mix of emotions, but ultimately, it seems to have lifted a heavy burden from your shoulders. The closure you found in those final moments with him allowed you to release the anger and resentment that had weighed you down for so long. As you move forward, may you continue to find solace in the love of your family and the precious moments of joy that life has to offer. I send you my sincerest blessings and well wishes for the future. What do you make of all this? And thank you for joining us on this long journey today in our space. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next video. Until next time.